So recently we've been saying a lot of good things about Microsoft's Xbox Series X, specifically in its chassis design and its highly innovative sandwich approach to internal system components. In terms of its overall size, think of Series X as two Xbox One Xs sitting side by side and well there you go, big but still console-like if you will. The console form factor is traditionally small, convenient, easily portable, but what about PC? Now, there are a number of reasons why consoles dominate the living room and form factor, I'd say, is one of them. And that's why I find Intel's new Ghost Canyon NUC, new unit of computing, well, that's why I find it really interesting. In theory, it possesses more CPU power than the next-gen consoles, with GPU performance that's likely to be broadly equivalent to what Sony delivers with PlayStation 5. It's a machine that can work well in your office, but it's also small and discreet enough to happily sit next to your TV in the living room. And, well, I rather like this design, the entire concept, actually. The PC is the ultimate evolving platform with the most versatility. Uh, it offers the most gaming choices to the mainstream. I like the idea of a small, portable PC that works just about anywhere. Now, some might say that such options are already available. Intel itself shipped its Hades Canyon NUC a little while ago, and you might remember that I looked at that. Despite some heat issues, I kind of liked it. Then, of course, there's the concept of the gaming laptop. Not only can you take one of those anywhere, it has a screen too, obviously. Surely you're not going to get that much more portable than that. But the Ghost Canyon NUC has a key advantage. One of the most crucial aspects of the entire PC experience, in my opinion, is DIY upgrading. And this is part and parcel of the new NUC's remarkable design. It's actually fundamental to the design concept. But let's talk about the specs first for the review unit I've got here in context with how it all sits together. Essentially, the Ghost Canyon NUC sandwiches a compute element and GPU together, uh, like so, with both core components slotting into a subboard at the bottom of the unit. The compute element is essentially a replaceable self-contained motherboard with soldered on processor. In this case, we've got a mobile orientated Core i9-9980HK, eight cores, 16 threads. Now I could list the clocks, but it's kind of pointless really. Uh, frequency depends on thermals and power and changes radically according to the workload. I noticed around a minimum of 3.0 gigahertz for heavy multi-core workloads and anything up to 4.3, 4.4 gigahertz in gaming. The compute element is basically a motherboard, as I said, enclosed in this chassis here. Uh, it also includes memory slots, therefore, and a couple of NVMe M2 slots. The CPU isn't visible here, uh, but it's under that copper heatsink, soldered to the board. Next to the compute element is the GPU. This is a mini version of the RTX 2070, and it's provided by ASUS. This card isn't the best of the best. It's not RTX 2080 Ti, obviously. It's still pretty good, though. Think uh, GTX 1080 levels of performance, sometimes a fair bit higher, but with all of the latest ray tracing and DX12 ultimate features. ASUS produced a small form factor version of this card, and as we shall discover, it's kind of curious in performance terms, but small, it certainly is. Here's a quick look at some CPU benchmarks. According to Cinebench R20, the 8-core 16-thread 9980HK has 92% of the Core i9-9900K's stock single-thread power, but only 68% of its full multi-threaded output. I'm using the 9900K here as a comparison point, as it's essentially the same silicon, but being a desktop chip, it has a much higher power budget. In multi-core performance, the 9980HK has around 93% of the Core i7-9700K's power. The i7 substitutes threads for raw clocks. So that's pretty good, but it's video encoding that is the real test. And let me explain why. Prolonged saturation of the cores causes more thermal challenges. And if you were to test the 9980HK in a laptop, it would suffer pretty badly by comparison. But here, it seems that the NUC is keeping the chip adequately cooled. On H.264, you get 67% of the 9900K's performance, and even in the more challenging, demanding HEVC encoding, pretty much the same. The results against AMD's mobile-orientated Ryzen 7 4800H might give Intel some pause, though. They are rather close. And remember, that result was taken from a thermally constricted notebook. Overall, in the Ghost Canyon NUC, the benches suggest a chip 
that sits somewhere between Core i5-9600K and Core i7-9700K, but skewed much closer to the i7 results. I'm going to talk about gaming performance with CPU and GPU in a moment, but first of all, a quick word about thermals, power draw and noise. The fans can spin up unexpectedly, even when faced with the simplest of tasks, which is kind of strange. But um, under consistent load, uh, noise level from the NUC, I'd say it's noticeable but not off-putting. It's not quite as discreet as an Xbox One X, but I'd say it's on par or better than PS4 Pro if you want that kind of console comparison point. It draws around 270 watts from the wall during gaming with CPU temperatures in the 80s and GPU in the 60s. There's nothing stopping you having the NUC resting horizontally or vertically, but I've got to say that laying it on its side as I did to uh, sort of demonstrate the machine as a desktop unit here. Very definitely a mistake. As you'll see on screen there, the GPU creeps into the 80s and hits the thermal limit, impacting performance. So yeah, forget about flexibility in this respect. Ignore my labored attempts to depict a real life desktop scenario here. Keep the NUC vertical. Okay then, next job. Let's talk about gaming performance and the RTX 2070 here. It's been a while since I tested the standard desktop model, but tapping into legacy data on legacy games, well, those are unlikely to have seen any kind of driver update in the meantime. And what we get, therefore, is something quite curious. Yes, this is a full-fat RTX 2070 in silicon terms, but performance output is definitely lower. Now, it may well be that the clocks are a touch lower. They do seem a bit lower than I recall, but I don't think that's actually the reason for the variance in frame rates. Maybe it's the curious interconnectivity between CPU and GPU lowering bandwidth. I'm not sure, but the numbers are checked and double checked. So let's dig in a bit more deeply. I'm benching at 1440p resolution here, a good match for this card. And I'm comparing the NUX performance with a desktop RTX 2070 and the recently released RTX 2060 Super which is just a touch slower. As a bonus here, I overclocked the NUX GPU with plus 150 MHz to the core, plus 500 MHz to the G6 RAM. Yes, obviously, we are using different CPUs for testing here, but at 1440p, we're very definitely GPU limited in all of these titles. Legacy games obviously means Crisis 3. It always does. All paths lead to Crisis 3 at some point in one of my tech reviews. You'll see that the overall grouping of performance across all four data points here is pretty close. But regardless, the reference 2070 is an 8% lead over the NUC, a advantage that drops to just 1% with the overclock in place. 2060 Super is just a couple of points faster than the stock NUC, but overclocking the custom ASUS GPU pushes it ahead. So you seem to be getting most of the stock 2070's performance then, but not quite all of it. Curiously, while overclocking adds between 20 to 30 watts of power consumption, temperatures on the GPU were still in the 60s Celsius. So yeah, I think you can get away with overclocking, to be honest, and it did seem quite stable overall. As long as the side and top vents are not obscured, GPU heat dissipation actually looks to be pretty good here. Far Cry 5 next, and pretty much a repeat of the crisis situation as you would expect. Reference 2070 has a 7.5% performance lead, dropping to 2% when the NUX ASUS custom card is overclocked. This time, the OC isn't quite enough to overcome 2060 Super, but the Super's lead is so small it's barely worth mentioning. So yeah, effectively we are talking about margin of error stuff here. Perhaps inevitably, similar with our last legacy gaming test, Assassin's Creed Unity. Haven't seen this one for a while. Um, stock 2070, eight points ahead of the mini ASUS card in the NUC, with overclocking slashing that lead to just 2.5%. The overclock actually puts the NUX graphics core on level ground with 2060 Super across the length of the bench. Interesting results then, and it should be noted that with the overclock in place, clocks are in the 1.9 to 2 gigahertz range. If this were the desktop card we'd previously been testing with that overclock in place, these frequencies would be delivering appreciably more performance. So yeah, still a bit of a mystery there. On to CPU testing now, which is arguably more interesting. Should be relatively straightforward to update the GPU you get in the NUC, but unless you swap out the entire compute element, Core i9-9980HK is the best you're going to get. You could possibly get extra performance from faster memory in CPU-bound scenarios, but don't expect revelatory changes to the status quo that's about to unfold before your eyes. 
First of all, though, there was a bit of a logistical challenge here in that all of our desktop CPU data is captured using an RTX 2080 Ti at 1080p resolution. The aim being to put CPU to the forefront without graphics as a bottleneck. This required some modification to the NUC. Basically, the RTX 2070 was uh, removed and then I used a PCI Express riser cable to hook in the 2080 Ti. Uh, the NUC's power supply was more than capable of running it. You do get two 8-pin power leads there. System load was in the 350 watt range during this testing, but remember that the GPU is being somewhat underutilized here. Ashes of the Singularity CPU test. It stresses all cores, it totally eliminates GPU from uh, the equation, and it is based on actual gameplay conditions, albeit with no unit destruction, and this heightens the load on the processor. As there's thread saturation here, clock speeds go down to the lowest I saw, 3.8 gigahertz, uh, the lowest in gaming, certainly. That's enough to give the 9900K a 25% lead, dropping to 9% versus the 9700K, both desktop chips, remember. The stress on multi-thread performance is enough to give Ryzen 7 3700X a convincing lead too, 12.5%. Crisis 3, this cutscene is repeatable and stresses all cores and all threads. Depending on the workload, the CPUs jostle for position here, but the 9900K has a 17-point lead. Or, to put it another way, 9980HK has 85% of the 9900K's performance. i7, 9700K, still faster, but across the bench, the 9980HK in the NUC is essentially on par with Ryzen 7 3700X. And that's not too bad, actually. We'll close off with Far Cry 5, a game I like to use for a specific type of CPU testing in gaming. The Junior engine is heavily reliant on single-core power, and as such, the insane clocks of the 9900K and the 9700K easily overwhelm it with 27 and 23% performance uplifts over the NUC's 9980HK. However, despite the NUC achieving the same single-core performance in Cinebench as the 3700X from AMD, 9980HK has an 8% frame rate advantage here. So basically, performance overall is most similar to the 3700X, sometimes faster in single-core heavy tasks, sometimes slower across all cores and threads. Now, eight cores, 16 threads. Why aren't we getting full Intel desktop class performance here? Well, just remember that the 9900K and 9700K are given more memory bandwidth in these benchmarks, and they achieve higher sustained clocks because they have a much higher power budget. But yeah, this kind of illustrates the limits of the key component in the NUC that you can't upgrade without having to purchase a whole new compute element, which certainly isn't going to be cheap. Certainly in the short term, though, there's plenty of performance here. So let's talk about the upgrading procedure, which in turn kind of highlights the ingenuity of the NUX design. Dismantling it is fairly easy, but don't go into this thinking that construction is as simple as something like a mini ITX PC. It's a little more complex. Uh, a lot more fragile. It starts by unscrewing these two screws at the rear and in turn the top of the PC slides away. This component being the main exhaust actually with two 80mm fans. Note that there are no wires connecting the fans to the rest of the chassis. Once you shunt the top of the case into place, contacts rest together making an electrical connection. Next step, we're going to remove the meshed side covers here. And this is simple, they just slide out and indeed slide back in again, simple. Remove the screws, securing the GPU and the compute element. At this point, two screws are taken out to remove this bracket, then remove the power to the GPU, and it's relatively straightforward to prize out the ASUS RTX 2070. So yeah, upgrading the GPU, at least that bit's simple. Now in theory, removing the compute element itself should also be simple, but there are more cables attached. There's power, obviously, and next to that, USB 3.0 internal extension. But to cut a long story short, there's also some additional wires to pull out, plus the Wi-Fi antennas. Soon we reach the point where the compute element itself can be removed. What's left in the chassis is basically three expansion slots there. Uh, yeah, you'll note that the GPU actually covers up an additional expansion slot. Uh, so you could remove the GPU entirely for more expansion and rely on the iGPU. There's also an additional NVMe slot in there. Once we've removed the compute element in its entirety, two screws here keep the shroud in place. Remove those and you can peek inside. Pretty simple design here. You've got two more NVMe slots plus your sodium memory. That's the laptop type. 
CPU is under the heatsink there. As it's soldered in and you can't replace it, I didn't bother removing it. Upgrading the CPU means swapping out the entire compute element after all. Moving on, I think we need to talk about prices. The Ghost Canyon NUC. I'd like to see it as a blueprint for the future, a standard that could become as prevalent as, say, Mini ITX. I mean, releasing GPUs in this form factor shouldn't be a problem. The compute element design. Well, whether it's Intel or AMD, there's plenty of opportunity here for some uh, really strong performance. Uh, standards, that's what we need here. Standards drop prices. And this is very much a niche design with a very high price point in the here and now. Intel seems to realize that too, hence some interesting packaging to kind of justify the price premium. So yeah, the machine comes in a flight case with a shoulder strap for easy portability. Hardly essential, but certainly cute. There's even a black light torch for highlighting the skull motif there. Perhaps not so cute, but faintly amusing nonetheless. So I'm hopeful that this form factor could potentially catch on, especially when the likes of Razer and Corsair are producing their own chassis variants that are large enough to run an RTX 2080 Ti. But despite cheaper i7 and i5 compute elements being available, bang for the buck in terms of pricing versus sizing, still has to go to the mini ITX form factor. Now that is going to be a bigger machine, considerably so with many chassis, but you can still build living room friendly designs. You have your choice of components and no limit on CPUs, uh, water cooling or whatever. Thing is though, I really like what the Ghost Canyon NUC is doing here. I like how Intel has tackled some pretty severe engineering challenges and when you have so much power contained in such a small little box, but still retain the ability to upgrade and expand over the years in the ways that a console can't. I think that's pretty great. Anyway, that's all from me for now. Please do like and subscribe to support the work we do here at Digital Foundry. And of course, there's that bell. It's there to be rung. And doing so grants you instant notifications whenever we post new video content onto the channel. The Digital Foundry Patreon, that's there for those who love what we do and want to support the team more directly, and in return you'll get pristine quality video downloads of everything we do. But that's all from me for now. Thanks for making it all the way to the end of this one, and just generally, thanks for watching and supporting Digital Foundry.